In these perilous times, see from current events how biblical prophecy is coming to pass in front of our eyes. You're watching In the Last Days, the program that looks at Israel and the end times with teaching from a Hebraic perspective. With Martin and Natalie Blackham, thank you to our friends and partners who make this program possible. Now, here's Martin and Natalie. Hi, welcome to the In the Last Days television program. Really great to have you with us wherever you're watching today across the UK, into Europe, and of course on the internet. And uh, you're not going to want to miss one second of this. By the way, you'll recognize that uh, we have a different set behind us, and I'll, I'll talk a bit about that in a minute. But uh, we have Simon Barrett. Great to have you with us, Simon. You're here in the flesh. And, yes, uh, very much welcome very much so, Martin. Welcome to Haradar and uh, the studio, uh, our studio and the new set. Um, and uh, maybe, maybe you can tell the viewers a little bit about why you're in Israel. Uh, two reasons. Uh, one of the main reasons why I'm actually here in Israel with my wife, uh, Katie, is because of uh, one of my best friends has got married. She's an Israeli. She had a wedding um, a day before Pesa, which is Passover. And uh, anyone who's wanting to fly to Israel to before Passover know an absolute nightmare is in terms of getting flights. So uh, it was actually a miracle we actually got onto the flight. And uh, maybe I'll tell them something a bit about the set. We've, we've um, got a new set which we've uh, just put up to, uh, ready for the program today. And uh, we're hoping to do uh, some live links and uh, maybe we'll get to talk to you when you're with Jen or when you're in the, in the studio in England. And oh, that'd absolutely. Be really nice. well, that'd be good. It'd be good to have you on uh, behind the headlines. I w well, I was going to uh, start with, well, first of all, I know that a lot of the viewers uh, will be very touched really because I know that they really s like the work that you do, they really support that uh, and uh, I was, when I was doing the research for the program I you know, found an email where they were uh, very happy with, you know, saying it's gonna, really looking forward to the interviews that you do and you do an amazing amount of work. You, you not only do the, um, the Middle East reports, you do Euro the re European reports, so I guess you have to travel across to, well you are, I've seen you in the, in the European Parliament, so you film there and you also do behind the headlines. And in the past, you've also done our mornings. I don't know if you yeah. still do that. Uh, well, they changed it because uh, the um, management revelation thought it would be better to give me my uh, a new program that more reflected the type of programs I do in the Monday morning. So behind the headlines uh, suited the program more because we're looking at the news, looking at the stories behind the headlines, plus also having that live interaction with the viewers, which is which is a very good thing. And it's, it's not the same program without the viewers. And going with, as you know, with live television, anything can happen, which is always fun. Um, but yeah, uh, it, it's quite amazing how it's starting to develop. I did my first uh, Middle East report back in uh, May of 2011 um, uh, as a pilot scheme, and, and that worked really well. I enjoyed doing the program. It was hard getting the program started off to start with because you had to uh, struggle to get the guests. And um, But once the program Maybe got established... Maybe people don't realise that, Simon. You know, um, one of the things is when you when you do presenting, people don't realise. They think that guests just pop up, but actually, there's a lot of work to organise that, uh, to get the guests to come in, and you know, the right guests to fit into the story that you want to do a certain certain theme. I mean, certainly something we have to push through on here in Israel is to get guests into the studio. Sometimes it's very easy and sometimes it's very difficult and when you get someone you know who's who really fits that story or who is really you really on the ball you feel so excited and not just that but you have to do all the research so that when the guest comes in that you you've got something you you know their background etc. Uh, absolutely I don't think you, you're nothing without the research. Uh, I think the research is the most important part of the programming because you're producing the program you have to look at see what's in the news you have to ask the right questions that some of the viewers will want um, questions to. So I think it's very important to do that research, to have the proper preparation. Um, also use uh, quite a few clips as well. So it's also researching clips to use. Do I use them, do I not? I usually have about seven or eight clips. I only show three or four in the Middle East report. Um, but I've got them ready. And, and so I give my producers a bit of a nightmare. So no, uh, don't go with that clip, go with that one and what have you. So I keep them on their toes. Um, but there's an awful lot of preparation goes into it. Um, the European report takes a lot more preparation, not only because I have to get the Euro staff from, from London to uh, Brussels, but uh, because it's a, a panel guest, I rely on my contacts and friends in Brussels to help try and get the guests. We've got a great relationship there with the uh, Jewish community in Belgium, plus also with the Israeli embassy. 
um, to the EU, so they help uh, give us diplomats for the program and uh, you know, probably never have a problem getting uh, MEPs onto the program. But getting them to sit for 56 minutes, that's probably the biggest challenge in the European Parliament. But, you, but the programs you do in, in um, the, the uh, European report, they record them in, or do you, you don't do those live? Uh, no, right? th they're not live. Um, what we do is we actually uh, use the facilities within the European Parliament. Uh, they've got a nice studio there, which is a circular studio, and uh, you can sometimes be sitting there interviewing people, and you've got people walking around the whole studio, so you have to be extremely focused when you're doing a programme, otherwise you get distracted. Um, but it's a nice set, and uh, you know, for people who enjoy, if you get bored of the interview, and you, know, you like people watching, then it's quite a good programme for that reason. But, but no, it's, it's a good set there, and it's all filmed in high definition, cameras and what have you, and there's a production team that, uh, that are supplied by the European Parliament who actually produce the programme. Uh, and then when the program's finished, they give me a link, and then I'll give that to, to Joel in, in Surbiton, and then he plays around with it, edits it, and then it's ready to go. And the peop uh, people also appreciate very much your work on um, behind the headlines. I think I saw you once where you were by yourself for some reason. Uh, Jen couldn't get in, or whoever was going to be with you couldn't get in, and I think I, I remember once you were, you were sat there. And what you might not know is that it could be quite scary to be by yourself, you've, you've got to do the whole program, there's no one, uh, because if you've got a guest, there's a bit of a respite while they're speaking, you can uh, do some, get everything next to run, but you, you did the whole program by yourself. Yeah, I don't really enjoy that. Um, <laughs> I, I like the interaction with the, with the viewer. Um, so, well, it's good to have the interaction with the viewers, uh, which, which I very much enjoy. So if the viewers are silent, that's when it becomes difficult because uh, I don't like talking to myself. Um, Howard is extremely good in front of talking to the cameras. He, he loves it and he's a natural at it. M myself, I don't tend to like it. I like to have a, a guest or a co-presenter to talk with in order to bounce ideas or bounce a conversation off or go in different directions. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, not, it's not great fun. I don't enjoy doing an hour speaking to the cameras by myself, to be honest. Um, so if I can avoid that, it's better. I did do one Middle East report uh, in which I did it was just, I had no guests because the guests couldn't, couldn't turn up, had to produce a programme. So I got two guests, uh, one from Israel and one from DC, talking about the subject. So I interviewed them uh, over the phone for the programme, but uh, I much prefer someone sitting next to me in the studio whilst doing the interview. I think, I think uh, Natalie also likes, although she's the, you've had, uh, Natalie, who's behind the scenes today, actually enjoyed, she did uh, some Hebrew by herself. That was very good, you know, and uh, you, if you want, if you'd like to look at those programs there on um, YouTube, she did some uh, t teaching of Hebrew, which is one thing uh, that we do on the United States TV program, and she just did it to camera, and I, I was very impressed. I, but f for me, I, unlike Natalie, I have to really prepare. I have to get the subject all ready and make sure that I've done uh, all the research and have some papers, like today, in front of me, so that um, I, I'm all ready to, to know what to say. Now, um, you have emails coming in. You, on, uh, behind the headlines, you have emails coming in live? They, they come straight in to yeah, you? Yeah, they, they come straight in. Uh, that's why it's a, a live and interactive program, uh, which is very good. Unlike the Middle East report, the European report, the uh, behind the headlines program is actually live, which is nice because you have that interaction with the viewers, and if they don't like the program, they tell you they don't <laughs> like the program. If they like it, they like it. But it, it, it's a way of really... Um, spicing up the debate really and um, being a little bit controversial in order to get a response from some of the viewers on some of the key issues that are affecting Christians in uh, Britain today. So uh, I like the interaction with the viewers. I think it's, it's, it's a great thing. It adds uh, a, a new thing to the, uh, to the program. And I think, it's a, I think it's a very good thing. So uh, thanks to uh, emails and thanks now to iPads. That makes life very easy. And if, you, if you'd like to email us uh, at In The Last Days TV program, we'd love to hear from you. And we'll put the uh, email address on the screen at the moment. It's info at inthelastdays.com, info at inthelastdays.com. And uh, if you send us your email, uh, I think, I think uh, we were talking a bit before the program, and I think that this interaction is very important. It's um, a connection. People... I mean, one of the uh, reasons that we're here in Israel is that we can connect people in the UK to what's happening in Israel. We can be a window into Israel, and I think that the email is very important. We just had a, actually, we just had an email from Alaska. <laughs> and <laughs> people are watching. Got yeah. some Eskimos watching. That's good to know. <laughs> um, 
Uh, no, I don't think they were asking, but they, were, they emailed us from Alaska saying they really enjoyed the program. Uh, um, maybe I'll talk a bit about that on a future program, but they, they really enjoyed the program. They're really interested in the Jewish roots of the faith. Uh, just two years. So um, that's what I want to talk about next is the importance of Israel. Um, and uh, I think this is something that our viewers will really uh, understand and appreciate is the importance of the work that you do, the importance of Israel. And may maybe we can talk a bit about what's happening in Israel at the moment. We just had, and I was uh, looking at, um, the, the, you did the program on the Israeli election, you've done the program on Gaza. Maybe you can give, give us a bit of a, an update of how you see things. And you've also done anti-Semitism as well. Not to give you too many themes, but um, you know, how, how do you see things at the moment? It's very interesting to see them from someone else's eye. Sure, sure. I, if I take um, Israel's perspective, um, I think one thing that's happened which is very, very significant um, in Israeli history, and that's the uh, recent uh, Israeli elections. And, um, and now there's a coalition formed after almost uh, three or four months of uh, tagging into position to get one into uh, position. But this is the first time that the uh, ultra-Orthodox haven't been part of the uh, Israeli government, uh, which means that um, it's going to be a different Israel from now on. And, um, you know, speaking to, if you want to know anything about a country, it's always good to have a conversation with a taxi driver. And uh, when my wife and I were in Tel Aviv, we had a, 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 called a taxi, and uh, the taxi driver was so happy that the members of the uh, uh, religious right were not in this government, um, primarily because he says, look, you know, they don't pay taxes, you know, they don't serve in the Israeli army, and we're funding them and keeping them. And our families have to serve in the Israeli army. We have to pay huge taxes. The cost of living in Israel has gone through the roof. He's saying that in Tel Aviv that um, food prices are 30% higher than anywhere else in the world. Uh, and when you come here, you realize that they are higher. So this is probably one of the first Israeli elections where the, um, the Israeli-Arab conflict has not played a major role in determining where people should determine their votes. And that's why we've seen the rise of the, um, uh, the social movement party. Um, I think Yesh Hadid, I think the party that, that's uh, come to power, and I can't remember the name of the new finance minister who heads up this party. I know he's a leading personality in Israel. So it, it's going to be very interesting um, from that perspective. However, um, when we look at Israel's situation in the Middle East, uh, it's getting worse. We've seen through the Arab Spring the rise of dangerous Islamist groups such as the Muslim Brotherhood come to power in, uh, in Egypt with President Morsi. The rest of the mainstream media is absolutely silent on this issue. There is a very, very fragile peace now. Uh, I don't think you can all call it peace between Egypt and uh, Israel. They're supposed to be peace partners. Uh, in which Israel signed the uh, famous and historic Camp David Peace Accords of 1979, and yet you would think these two countries are uh, virtually at war because there's no diplomatic relation between the two countries. Uh, we have a situation in Jordan now where we're seeing the rise of the Muslim Brotherhood and the influence of the Muslim Brotherhood on the uh, Bedouin, uh, and it's the Bedouin that keep the Hashemites in power, certainly that of King Hussein of Jordan. So you were looking at uh, Jordan um, was being Israel's only real partner for peace in the Middle East, and, and that's becoming strained. We have the ongoing situation in, uh, in Syria with the civil war, um, and uh, that could actually overflow into the Golan Heights. Um, there's a danger of uh, Assad's uh, chemical, biological weapons falling into the hands of uh, uh, Al-Qaeda-type groups. So it's, it's a very fragile situation, and the same with Iran. I mean, Iran's getting even closer to developing nuclear weapons, and if Iran develops nuclear weapons, then becomes a game changer in the Middle East. And the situation will become very dangerous and very precarious. So it's, it's very fragile, and that's one thing, um, being a, a student of history, and one thing I, I'm so fascinated about the Middle East is that the whole Middle East can change within one hour. Um, so you know, if I was the Israeli Prime Minister, he's got so much things coming into his, onto his desk each day, intelligence reports about this, intelligence reports about that. Uh, it was only uh, yesterday, uh, only a couple of days ago, we, we found out there were riots in, um, uh, by the Damascus Gate in East Jerusalem over a, pr uh, a Palestinian prisoner dying of cancer, which then started, um, yeah, it's a, a violence can erupt in this region at any real time, as you probably know, living here. Um, so I think everything's calm at the moment, which is good. And, uh, and, and the great thing about being in Israel is the world is absolutely obsessed with Israel. And when you 
when you're here and, and something kicks off, you don't even feel it. You don't even sense it. And yet you go back to, to England, back to the UK, it's all across all the major headlines and it's huge. And he's only saying, oh, you know, what, what's this going on? You know, a couple of rockets going here, a couple of rockets there. Um, you don't actually feel it in the land because there's an incredible sense of peace. And you really sense that God's hand is upon this nation. And the one thing I love about being in Israel is having that open heaven. You start praying and you can really sense God's presence in here because he loves this people. He loves this land. He's fighting for it. And it's a beacon of light in the Middle East. Um, but in terms of Europe and the Jewish community, I've done many programs on the issue of anti-Semitism. Uh, and sadly, we're seeing a, a huge increase in anti-Semitism across Europe. Um, in 2012, according to um, the uh, Jewish community's um, security service in France, they've witnessed a 58% increase in anti-Semitism. In Belgium, it's 30% increase. And I think Britain... Uh, according to figures produced by the uh, Community Service Trust, who monitor the security and anti-Semitism in Britain, third highest on record. Um, so the situation is, is much worse facing Jewish communities in, in Europe. And that's why it's so important that Christians understand the danger of anti-Semitism, because it starts with the Jew, but never finishes with the Jewish people. Um, and it will affect all of us. It will affect our society, it will affect our democracy, it's like an evil poison that, that pollutes people's hearts and minds. And it has the capacity to destroy our society. So we only look back at history and see um, the complete evil that was manifested in Hitler uh, with his pursuit of wanting to destroy the Jewish people. We saw the destruction that caused Europe. Um, so I think, and I do believe, that uh, the Jewish people are God's canaries down the mine. And as soon as those dangerous gases come up and we know the Jewish people are in trouble, then watch out. We better watch out. Now, um, uh, this, this um, while, you, while you were telling us that, I was thinking about the uh, Aliyah, the importance of the Jewish people coming back to, to Israel. Um, because of that, in a way, whilst there's no justification for anti-Semitism, in a way you can see that it's like a, a, a prod, like a poke and saying, you know, the importance of the Jewish people coming back to the land. and like the community we live in here and the people who come and make Aliyah and we were at the airport, Nasi and I, seeing uh, Nefesh Ben Nefesh and uh, the Jewish people returning. Do you think that British, for the British Jewish people, it's, it's uh, I know it's not easy, but do you think there's a sense that they need to come back or? Um, well, that's, that's a very difficult question. Um, and I'll tell you why it's a difficult question, because this is the homeland for the Jewish people. This is the only Jewish state in the world. This is the only nation in the world that is welcome to Jews across the world who are facing persecution and anti-Semitism. They've got a home here. Um, they've, they know that they've got a government that will protect them, and they know that they've got a military force that will protect them. Um, so they know that this is a place of sanctuary. Um, but I, I, I also sense that um, Jewish communities ha and the Jewish community contribute tremendously, not only to the, the economy of a nation, but, but also to its intellectual uh, and it, 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 its spiritual um, prowess as a nation, in, in a sense. If I take, a, for example, Poland, for example, um, there were, prior to uh, World War II, there was um, something like around 8 million or so Jews maybe even more, living in Poland. And after World War II, there were none, uh, because that was the site of the, the gas chambers and everything else. Now, it's only in recent years that Poland, since they've um, had independence uh, from uh, communism rules, certainly from Russian uh, control and interference, and they've become a nation in their own right, the Polish people themselves have started to mourn the loss of their Jewish communities and their Jewish culture that they once had. And I, I also feel that if those Jewish communities then are uprooted, it leaves a huge spiritual moral vacuum behind. Um, we know that, that God has a great plan and he's wanting the Jewish people to return to their land as well. Um, but I also think that what's contributed so incredibly to the success of a nation has been the way that th that particular nation treats the Jewish people. And if we take the, uh, and sadly Britain's got a very poor record on the treatment of the Jewish people, particularly throughout the Middle Ages, um, as I think it was Edward the Confessor who kicked the Jews out in, in the 1300s um, and didn't actually return until Oliver Cromwell um, took power in the English Civil War and overthrew the monarchy. 
but if we look at the United States, the Jewish people have always been welcomed from the start of the American Revolution and the War of Independence. Um, it was George Washington who invited Jewish members of the Jewish community to be part of his uh, cabinet. And so America has always embraced the Jewish community. And, and then it's wonder why that they are so blessed as a nation, why they've become so big and so powerful and so prosperous. Um, and I very much think that a nation, the way a nation reacts uh, to the Jewish people, its own Jewish people, would depend on how much then God would bless that nation. Because, as you know, in Genesis it says, I will bless those who bless you and I'll curse those who curse you. So I think that is a fundamental one. If, for example, we see uh, a, a rapid increase in anti-Semitism in which Jewish communities are actually threatened and we see a mass exodus of the Jewish people across Europe, then I fear for Europe's future, I fear for Britain's future, um, because it's the Jewish people that, that have given us our heritage, our biblical heritage, um, the, the prophets, and even our own Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach, uh, is, you know, was a Jewish rabbi. Um, so I think that provides a very strong warning to our societies, how we treat the Jewish people. Um, we know, for example, that uh, if we take the, uh, the Russian aliyah, which occurred uh, around 1991. Israel absorbed around 1.5 million uh, Jewish Russians into Israel. It's an incredible feat. Um, and they can do it again, uh, and they can uh, restore. But I, I do fear for the world once that starts happening. And I, and I think that uh, what you might not realize at home is that it, it is a very tricky question. Whilst we want the Jewish people to return to Israel and be in the land, at the same time, as Simon was saying, you know, that they are part of the community. Some of them have had businesses, uh, restaurants in London, and, and um, it's, it's a, it, it isn't such an easy answer as people think. And um, I think this is helping a lot of people because a lot of people will, I mean, we're, I, I would have said I was pretty gung-ho on this. I would have said, well, why, you know, if I met them, I'd be like, why aren't you you're on a holiday here? You should be moving here. Why are you visiting? And um, I start to understand that it's a little bit more uh, uh, difficult, the issue, than that. Having said that, I know that in New York, where they've got a huge uh, Jewish population, um, you know, I can say, well, come on, you know, you the young people, you should at least try and make the effort. And, and I know that they, they do, uh, in Israel, they do birthright, where we see them in the, in the local um, stores that they come and they... Uh, visit the land and uh, they've encouraged them to come over and see what it's like to live here so but it's not such an easy answer is it to no not not for those living in the west not for those uh, jewish communities living in in uh, britain or europe or in the united states particularly in the united states where uh, you know the jewish people are so accepted as part of uh, normal american life uh, take for example the uh, comedy series called friends now you ha there's one episode where one of the characters celebrating Hanukkah and, uh, and the others celebrate Christmas. It, it's so, mu so much part of American culture and accepted as so much part of American culture um, that uh, a lot of American Jews are wealthy, they're well off, they've got professional jobs, why well, I want to give this up to go to Israel and join the army. Um, but there are those who are, are motivated by um, Zionism, the, the belief that the Jewish people should return home to serve in Israel. I mean, this is an incredible country. You can see that uh, prior to the uh, Jewish people returning to the land in the 1880s, this was pretty much a swamp land and, and desert land. It was a backwater of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and since the Jewish people have come back and re-established their uh, ancient homeland, you know, look at the flowers, look at the plants. You only have to look just outside your, your doorstep here, Martin, to realize how beautiful Israel is and, and what the Israelis are capable of doing and achieving. And that was one of the greatest fears back in the 1920s that the British had, was that they feared that if the Jewish people were allowed to establish their own state, they create an incredible utopia that the rest of the Arab, Arab world would want to follow. Um, and they felt that they would lose their control and influence. Um, and that's pretty much why they, they blocked a lot of the um, more immigration into Israel, the establishment of a Jewish state. Uh, and Israel's done incredible achievements around the world because they're in their land, they're amongst their, they're amongst their people. Um, and uh, uh, one thing I love about being here, you have this nice mix between uh, ancient and modern. It's a highly modern, advanced nation. At the same time, it's an ancient nation. I mean, you, you go to Masada and you see the... the uh, 
uh, the, the ruins there of um, the siege against the Romans. You visit the uh, Western Wall or the Hakot al uh, and you see that this is the outer wall of the you know, Second Temple. So it goes back 2,000 years. You can go to the Galilee in some areas. Uh, you're walking the same uh, views and seeing the same views that Jesus would have done over 2,000 years ago. And so Israel's very old and, and very new. Um, but after a while, um, and, and speaking to um, Chris Mitchell, I said, what's one of the biggest problems you faced being here in Israel as uh, the uh, bureau chief for CBN in Jerusalem? And he said to me, um, he said, when you stay uh, here for a long time, there's a pressure. The pressure gets to you. Um, so, and that's why a lot of Israelis, they, they live here for a little bit and they go around the world and then they come back. Because there's always that pull to come back because it's uh, you sense God's presence here and they know that this is where they're supposed to be. And uh, Israel's incredibly blessed as a nation. Um, just as we're coming to the uh, end of the program, I think we might even just be out of time. I was just going to uh, talk a bit about a bit more about anti-Semitism in in Europe, but um, I think we're we've uh, run out of time, folks. So it's been great to have you in the studio, Simon. Thank, Thank you, you so much for coming over. Awesome. Thank you. It's and, a pleasure. Um, you know, quite amazing to see you in the flesh because normally <laughs> we would see you, uh, we'd see Simon a after our program uh, airs on a, on a Monday on Revelation. So great, thank you so much for making the effort to come over to Haradar and be with us today. It's been great to be with you. Don't forget, uh, if you want to email us, it's info at inthelastdays.com. You can visit the website www.inthelastdays.com. And remember, we're living in the last days. You've been watching In The Last Days, a TV program with Martin and Natalie Blackham, the program that looks at Israel and the end times with teaching from a Hebraic perspective. If you would like to financially support the program or find out about conferences, meetings, or ministry products, then please contact us with the details on your screen. Visit our easy-to-use website at www.inthelastdays.com and register for our free e-newsletter Get the latest news from Israel, product information, online video teaching, or watch today's TV program at a time that's convenient to you. Thank you again, friends and partners, for making this program possible. See you same time, same station for the next program from In the Last Days.